ever since um, mine and Victoria's move to Florida was made official, and I realized that you know this Sunday and next Sunday are going to be the last two times I get to preach before you guys as, as my congregation and, and the people that the Lord has given me the privilege to be a pastor to. Uh, I've been trying to really think hard about what two messages I want to leave you all with. Right? And so I, I thought about doing maybe a two-part short series through a tiny book of the Bible, like, I don't know, like Obadiah, right? <laughs> Just to highlight the importance of verse-by-verse -verse preaching. Um, I've thought about maybe doing a heavier theological topic, right? Maybe to stress the importance of deepening our knowledge of theology. But in the end, uh, I think I've decided to devote a message each to the two most fundamental things that we are to understand as Christians, and that is the scriptures and the gospel. And so today we're going to deal with the scriptures. Before we start, though, if you guys will join me for one more word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you, uh, as always, for this opportunity you've given us to be together, Lord. I pray that you would speak at this time, primarily through your word and secondarily uh, through me as well. We love you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And so the question that I want us to, to, to deal with today being the scriptures, right? A few of you may know, uh, for those of you that, that I kind of talk to behind the scenes, um, whenever I'm like studying something, that's like the only thing I'm like <laughs> obsessed with and fixated with for the foreseeable future. And so I talk about it all the time. Right, and I've been obsessed for the past couple years with a particular topic, and that is the debate between Roman Catholicism and Protestantism. I've just been uh, going heavy into reading a bunch of modern treatments of this, reading you know, what are the disagreements that we have still today. They're a little bit different than they used to be at the time of the Reformation. Uh, trying to read maybe some of the original reformers and the things that they were uh, talking about. I've even started a very, uh, albeit very tiny, <laughs> YouTube channel to try to help some people, right? Because uh, these are some of these issues that when I started looking into this, I actually struggled with for a while. Right? And, and there's a lot of people out there, more than you think, who are really, really struggling with issues between Protestantism and something like Roman Catholicism or even Eastern Orthodoxy. And that, there's all kinds of issues that go into that. Right? I mean, the, the Protestant Reformation, uh, and the debates rather that began at the Protestant Reformation have been raging for the past 500 years and more, and they continue up, up until today. Right? And so as I've been researching this topic, of all the different things that there are, right, of all the different arguments and the places of disagreement, I've found that it all ultimately goes back to what we think about one thing, and that's the authority of the scriptures. And this is an issue that really transcends even just the Protestant and Roman Catholic debate. Right? It applies to every, really every single facet of our life. Right? The questions, what are the scriptures? How should we view the scriptures as Christians? What is the role of the scriptures in the, in the, in the church and in the everyday life of the Christian? How should we utilize the scriptures in parsing out what we believe and what we don't believe about all sorts of things? This is ultimately what's going to define the kind of Christians that we are, right? And when we look at even the Protestant Reformation, it had two principles, right? You have the five solas, uh, but there are two, really, that, that were the, the uh, formal principle and the material principle of the Reformation. We have sola fide, salvation by faith alone, and we also have sola scriptura, the scriptures alone. And so that's one of what I want to dedicate this message to, our core truth being that as Christians, the scriptures are our sole infallible rule of faith. Now notice, this is a very specific formulation. Right? It doesn't say that the scriptures are our sole rule of faith. Sometimes people get in this idea of like, you know, I can never have another uh, a role of, uh, uh, rule of faith. Right? I can never uh, uh, have something like a, a statement of faith for my church. I can never have a historic Christian creed that I, that I memorize, that I hold to as a good statement of what the scriptures say. I can never hold to a confession. And that's incorrect, right? So sola scriptura as Protestants, what we believe is that the scriptures are the sole infallible rule of faith. They're the norm that norms all norms. We have all kinds of authority in the Christian life. Uh, we have, on the local level, we have uh, our pastor, someone like me or Aaron, right, who can be uh, doctrinal authorities. When we stand here on Sunday morning, we are speaking with the authority, hopefully, of the scriptures, right? We have authorities, like I said, like historic Christian creeds, like confessions of faith, individual uh, church statements of faith, right, on different things. But at the end of the day, where I can go wrong, where Aaron can go wrong, where anything else could go wrong, and need to be corrected, the scriptures never need to be corrected. They're infallible, right? and they're the only infallible rule of faith. Other rules of faith are great, but even those rules of faith need to bend the knee to the scriptures. And so what I want us to talk about uh, as the, the truths that kind of build this up, we're going to talk a little bit about what scripture is, we're going to talk about how we are to view scripture, how the Lord Jesus Christ himself viewed scripture, and even how a couple people uh, in the early church viewed scripture. And so our first truth is that the scriptures are ontologically unique as the very speech 
of God himself. The word ontological is kind of a big word, don't, don't worry about it. That just means that there's something very special at the fundamental core of the existence of the scriptures. There's something about their very being that is special, and that is that they are the very speech of God himself. B.B. Uh, Warfield, who's a, a, a well-known uh, theologian and scholar, uh, he said this about the Bible. The religion of the Bible is a frankly supernatural religion. By this is not meant merely that according to it, all men as creatures live, move, and have their being in God. It is meant that according to it, God has intervened extraordinarily in the course of the sinful world's development for the salvation of men otherwise lost. In Eden, the Lord God has been present with, had been present with sinless man in such a sense as to form a distinct element in his social environment. This intimate association was broken up by the fall. But God did not therefore withdraw himself from the concernment with men. Rather, he began at once a series of interventions in human history by means of which man might be rescued from his sin and despite it, brought to the end destined for him. The religion of the Bible thus announces itself not as the product of men's search after God, if happily they may feel after him and find him, but as the creation in men of the gracious God, forming a people for himself that they may show forth his praise. In other words, the religion of the Bible presents itself as distinctively a revealed religion. Or rather, to speak more exactly, it announces itself as the revealed religion, as the only revealed religion, and sets itself as such over against all other religions, which are represented as all products in a sense in which it is not of the art and device of man. So I think Beaver Warfield put it pretty well. But as we're thinking about, uh, uh, we're about to approach the scriptures, see what the scriptures have to say about themselves, what B.B. Warfield is getting at here is that we have Christians have, you know, another big word, we have a, what we call a revelational epistemology. Big words, the big words don't matter. But the concept behind that is, epistemology is a study of how we know what we know. Right? The theory of how we gain knowledge. And what the Bible's core principle is, is that the way that we gain knowledge about God, the way that we gain knowledge about the supernatural, the way that we gain knowledge about the purpose of all things, is through revelation. And it's revelation from God. There are certain things that we can pick up from nature, right? Romans chapter 1 tells us that the, the existence of God, the attributes of God are clearly seen by the things that are made. Yes, even his eternal Godhead. And so there are things that we can kind of glean from nature, but as B.B. Warfield points out, we're fallen in sin. And if every part of us has fallen in sin, then our reasoning has fallen. And as Romans 1 says, we actually suppress the truth of God that we see in the things around us in unrighteousness. And so what is needed in order to have a relationship with God is for the Lord to reveal himself to us. And what the Lord does, as our argument is as Christians, is that he reveals himself. Yes, he's done it through prophets in the past. He's spoken uh, orally to people. We, we see that uh, you know, throughout the Old Testament. But he's really, really revealed himself and inscripturated it in the scriptures. And it's interesting because the scriptures are not like they are in, in other religions where it's, oh, maybe things were just straight up dictated to somebody and they wrote it down. There's something very special about the scriptures. And so let us turn to our first passage, and that's 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. And uh, Peter says this, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when, we, when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such a declaration as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this declaration made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture becomes a matter of someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. This is a crucial passage for us to understand what the scriptures are claiming about themselves. Right, because the scriptures are often maligned today. They're seen as any number of things. They're seen as you know, vaguely good moral writings that you kind of have to like, sift through and pick out what you think is good and, and get rid of what you think is bad. Or they're seen as maybe these outdated writings of ancient men who were trying, you know, they were, they were doing their best to put together uh, some rules of ethics. And, but you know, we're, we're, we're in the modern age, baby, and so they got some things wrong, and we're going to correct that. Right? They're seen as all kinds of things. But ultimately... You know, where any of these things could be true, if, were, if these were just any other set of human documents, the scriptures are not. As Peter tells us, no prophecy of scripture becomes a matter of someone's own interpretation. It's not the writer himself just writing down whatever he feels like, just his own interpretation. No prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but by men who were moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And so we have this from, for the prophets themselves, and we have this also 
for those that are writing the scriptures. They are carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so we have this picture of the Holy Spirit is utilizing these people, not like automatons where, you know, like they, they, their eyes are on the back of the head and they black out and they're writing things. But somehow the Lord is choosing once again to intermingle with humanity in a very special way to where the Holy Spirit is moving the hearts and the minds of the author to write the very words of God. Right? They're saying they spoke from God. And what's interesting here, another thing too, is at the beginning, right here uh, in verse 19, Peter says, and so we have the prophetic word made more sure. Do you see how remarkable that is? Previously, he's talking about how they were, he's like, man, we were eyewitnesses. We were literally there and we heard God from the heavens speak. He's talking about Jesus' baptism where the Lord says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And he's saying that the scriptures are a prophetic word made more sure. That's massive, right? If you have an eyewitness of the Lord Jesus Christ and he's saying like, hey, the scriptures are a prophetic word made more sure than even the things that we've witnessed, that's a really big deal. That's a really big claim for the scriptures, right? And so let's see how the Lord Jesus himself, right? Now there, uh, we talk about eyewitnesses and, and the gospels. Let's see uh, a story of how the Lord Jesus Christ himself uses the scriptures in his own ministry. Matthew 22, verses 23 through 33. It says, uh, and just for context sake, right? We know the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Jewish teachers of the day, they kept coming to Jesus and they kept trying to trip him up, right? They're trying to give him these hard questions. They're trying to see if he'll say something wrong, and now they can finally justify their anger with him because they're upset that he's pointing out how, hypocr how hypocritical they are, how lofty they're making themselves up to be in front of the, the, the people that really need God's word. And so this is another one of those instances where the Sadducees, these people that, uh, you know, these teachers that they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead, they're showing up and they're hitting Jesus with one of the common questions they had to kind of come up with to debate these things out. And so it says, the same day the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked them, saying, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were with us seven brothers. The first died after he had married, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, even to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said to them, you are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, and this is key, notice the very specific way that he says it. Have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Notice what Jesus is saying, right? He's saying, well, number one, he's impugning them because he's like, hey, you don't even know the scriptures. The reason you're getting this wrong, the reason why you think this is such a, a knockdown question is because you haven't even searched the scriptures earnestly for an answer. And so that's number one. But more importantly than that, right, have you not read what was spoken to you by God saying? There's something interesting happening here. Right? This isn't just like, a, oh, did you not read the account of Moses when God spoke to Moses? No, it's, have you not read what God himself said to you? And so here we have this unique picture coming together of the scriptures are not just, you know, like we said, not just some automaton writing things down that God is dictating. It's the Lord, through his Holy Spirit, is inspiring these authors to write his words. The Lord looks at the scriptures and he sees his speech coming from him. And what does that mean, right? It means that there is a unique authority that is vested in the scriptures. The way that B.B. Warfield uh, covers what, what I'm talking about is, is through this quote. He says, the biblical books are called inspired as the divinely determined products of inspired men. The biblical writers are called inspired as breathed into by the Holy Spirit so that the product of their activities transcends human powers and becomes divinely authoritative. Inspiration is therefore usually defined as a supernatural influence exerted on the sacred writers by the Spirit of God, by virtue of which their writings are given divine trustworthiness. And so as Christians, sometimes we see this attitude in the culture of, well, you know, the Bible, you know, it may, it may have said X, Y, or Z, and I don't really like that, but maybe that's just Paul's opinion. Maybe that's just Peter's opinion. Maybe that's just, it isn't. If what the scriptures are claiming about themselves is true, then this is the very speech of God himself. And as the speech of God himself, there is no higher court that we could appeal to. They're self-authoritative. They're authoritative over everything. And so when we look at the scriptures, we need to realize what we're dealing with here. Right? We're dealing with the very speech of God. That's so special. 
right? <laughs> it's, it's something that, at least for me, I don't know about you guys, but the more that I, I sit back and I, I look at theological truths like this, things that we kind of take for granted, right? We call it oh, the word of God, but we never kind of slow down and think about it. When we hold up a Bible, we're holding the very speech of the living God. That's amazing, right? That, and that should excite us. And, and that's something that I think we'll, we'll talk about uh, here in a second. So I want to move on to our second truth. And that is that accordingly, right, because we, the scripture has this divine authority, not from the authors themselves, but from God who is inspiring the authors, we should test all traditions and ideas of man according to the scriptures. And so let's get right into the, the biblical basis for it. This is one of the things that happened at the Reformation. This idea that, that uh, you know, with the, the reformers of the Roman Catholic Church was really controversial because the church had, and to this day still has, uh, all of these ideas that are, well, these came from tradition, the oral tradition of the apostles, the oral tradition handed down from generation to generation. And that's where they ground things like purgatory. That's where they ground things like the bodily assumption of Mary, that Mary was sinless from her birth. That's where they were grounding uh, things like indulgences, that you could give money to the church and buy your way out of purgatory. Theology has consequences. And when we don't place the scriptures at the rightful place as the judge over all things, including man-made traditions, there are real consequences, right? And there are consequences over our lives, there are consequences. Uh, it's, it's sometimes even, you know, as, as much as I want to read these things charitably, sometimes it's so infuriating. You read some accounts, and it's like you have, uh, in, in the Middle Ages, you have peasants that are giving two, three months wages, their life savings, for a little piece of paper that tells them that now their little daughter who passed away is now out of purgatory. A place that is not in the scriptures. Right? A place that the scriptures nowhere speak about for all the importance that it's given in the Middle Ages that comes from this oral tradition. So we want to make sure that we test all traditions and ideas of man according to the scriptures. And so our question then about this should be, well, do we see traditions being tested in the scriptures, right? And we want to apply that same rule to what I'm saying. And so let's see what Jesus does. In Mark chapter 7, Verses 1 through 13, again, the Pharisees doing that same routine as the Sadducees, right? The Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, to Jesus, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many other such things you do. And he said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, If a man says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me is korban, that is, a gift to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. And so what is going on here, right? The Lord Jesus Christ is being approached, and he's being impugned because, hey, your disciples aren't following the traditions of the elders. Whoa, right? <laughs> yeah, this, this lofty claim about this tradition that's been handed down, and we all follow it, and they're not doing it. Why is that? And Jesus calls them out for being hypocrites because he's like, you know, you're talking about these traditions, but what about the sovereign tradition that matters? And that's what's found in the scriptures. And he's like, you guys don't even follow that. And he's pointing out this thing, this korban, what we call the korban rule. It was this rule that the Pharisees had come up with. That even though the Old Testament tells you that you need to take care of your mother and father when they're elderly and when they can't take care of themselves, they came up with this rule that is like, oh, if I just, you know, if I say that whatever profit you might have for me is a gift to God, it is korban, they're going to give it to the temple, then I don't have to take care of you anymore. They're just making things up, right? They're making things up, and oh, wow, it sounds so holy. Oh, it's a gift to God. Sorry, mom and dad. <laughs> My money's going to God, right? And it sounds so holy, and it sounds so lofty to walk up and say to Jesus, the traditions of the elders, it's like, whoa, this whole crowd is against you. And Jesus just tells them, hey, you're making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down. All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep 
your tradition. And so here we see Jesus saying, hey, the scriptures, right, which, which speak of these things, they have authority that you don't. And they have authority that the elders don't. And the curious thing, thing here that is really interesting is this Corban rule, the Pharisees claimed that this was orally handed down from Moses. Right? And so it's like, whoa, it's the elders. And, and it, the text doesn't say it, but it's, we know it from other uh, texts and stuff of the day. They thought it went back to Moses. Oh, Moses gave us the secret oral tradition. And Jesus rebukes them, just offhand. You're forsaking the word of God for your tradition. And so here we see Jesus doing this, right? Jesus doesn't uh, listen to what they say. He's not intimidated by this show of strength of all oh, the elders the tradition say, right? He doesn't accept it uncritically and say, oh, you know what? Yeah, washing pitchers and couches, yeah, we, might, you know, we might as well. Come on, come on, boys. He critically looks at it and he assesses it in accordance with the scriptures. And that is the example that is set forth by our Lord. Right? I mean, and this is the Lord Jesus himself. I mean, he's literally God. If he wanted, he could have just said, well, hey, by divine decree, but he's appealing to the things that he's already revealed. He's revealed them through the scriptures. And we see this attitude and example set forth by Jesus carries actually into early church history. I'm going to give you two examples uh, before we move on to, to our third and final point here in a second. Uh, there are two examples here from figures in the early church that fall under the category of church fathers. Uh, the church fathers uh, are essentially just, think of them as the pastors and the theologians of the early church after the time of the apostles, around the year 100, going through about like the 7th century, more or less, right? And so, according to the Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church, an easy little definition here, uh, the leading uh, church fathers were the authors of much work vital to Christianity. They defended the gospel against heresies and misunderstandings. They composed extensive commentaries on the Bible, explanatory, doctrinal, and practical, and published innumerable sermons largely on the same subject. They exhibited the meaning and implications of the creeds, they recorded past and current events in church history, and they related the Christian faith to the best thought of their own age. And so you have a lot of these guys, and they're, 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 these, they're these big theologians, and they were spending all their time writing these innumerable works, right? And so let's see the attitude uh, of a couple of these men, because let's keep in mind, in the early church, you have people that are appealing to all oh, the traditions, and you have both Orthodox Christians doing that, Christians that are, that are rightfully standing up for the scriptures, and the tradition that they're really talking about is the scripture, a lot of the time, most of the time. And the ones that you have appealing to these secret, binding oral traditions, a lot of the time are actually these heretical groups that were popping up. And so I want to cover here uh, the biblical attitude of Jesus, right, in action, this, this, hey, let's analyze things according to the scriptures, in action in two church fathers, Cyril of Jerusalem and Basil the Great. Uh, according to theologian William Webster, uh, Cyril was Bishop of Jerusalem from 348 A.D. to about 386 A.D. In his treatise, The Catechetical Lectures, right, this treatise is super important by, uh, by Cyril because this is the earliest documentation that we have of the catechetical instruction of the early church, M basically just the way that, that people were instructed in the foundations of the early church. Right? You have people that are what we call catechumens, they're new to the faith, and they want to be instructed, and this is the earliest documentation we have of that instruction process. And so in this work, Cyril gives an exposition of the Christian faith for those who are being prepared for baptism. He gives a systematic defense, an explanation of the canon of truth and the rule of faith. This is an exhaustive treatise on what was taught to the initiates into the Christian faith around the mid-fourth century. It is, in effect, the Apostles' Creed. Right? We've talked about this in the past and other sermons uh, that kind of lays out the basics of the faith. And so following the example of other church fathers, Cyril wrote with conviction of the divine inspiration of the scriptures, the absolute authority of the Old and New Testament. He referred to them some 15 times as holy, 29 times as divine, three times as sacred, and four times as divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit. Let's look at a quote from, from this uh, catechetical work by Cyril. He says this, for concerning the divine and holy mysteries of the faith, not even a casual statement must be delivered without the holy scriptures, nor must we be drawn aside by mere plausibility and artifices of speech. Even to me who tell you these things, Give not absolute credence, unless you receive the proof of the things which I announce from the divine scriptures. For this salvation which we believe depends not on ingenious reasoning, but on demonstration of the holy scriptures. And so we see even from early Christianity after the apostles, we see people that are applying this metric. Like he's talking to new Christians and he's like, hey, don't even take my word for it unless I'm backing it up from the scriptures. Don't hear anything, not even a casual statement must be delivered without the scriptures. And why? Because our salvation, right? There's all kinds of human traditions that they seem so ingenious and they seem so cool and so lofty. 
But our salvation, as Cyril says, which we believe depends not on ingenious reasoning, but on demonstration of the Holy Scriptures. Let's see another example. Uh, Basil the Great. Basil was one of the, uh, what we call the three Cappadocian church fathers. Right? They were responsible for finally formulating this, uh, the defense of the Trinity, right? that what would ultimately defeat major heretical groups in early church history, like that of the Arians. Right? The Arians were a group of heretics that denied that Jesus was God. He thought he was a really good and great creation of God, but that he wasn't God. You have the, new, uh, the Numa Tomakai, a group of heretics who were denying the deity, the deity of the Holy Spirit. They thought the Holy Spirit was like a force, you know? And so this next quote is, a, is from a letter that Basil the Great wrote due to a controversy with this Numa Tomakai group, the group of heretics that denied the deity of the Holy Spirit. And so Basil was being accused by them of introducing novel teaching when he said the Holy Spirit is God. That it's three persons, one God, right? Three persons, one essence. And so... When Basel was accused by these guys, he was accused because it contradicted their tradition. So the interesting things about church history is you see a lot of guys that are like, oh, I actually have the secret tradition from the apostles that you don't have. Like the apostles gave me the special thing. And then, you know, it's kind of like, don't ask further questions. <laughs> All right? And we kind of see this a lot even to this day. And so notice what Basel has to say about their argument that his view is novel because it contradicts their traditions. Basel says, their complaint is that their custom does not accept this, and that scripture does not agree. What is my reply? I do not consider it fair that the custom which obtains among them should be regarded as a law and rule of orthodoxy. If custom is to be taken in proof of what is right, then it is certainly competent for me to put forward on my side the custom which obtains here. If they reject this, we are clearly not bound to follow them. Notice this. Therefore, let the God-inspired scriptures decide between us. And on whichever side be found doctrines in harmony with the word of God, in favor of that side will be cast the vote of truth. And so we see a couple of things here from Basel. We see, again, this, this idea of, hey, the scriptures have an authority that trumps my tradition, that trumps your tradition. If our traditions disagree, let's look to the scriptures because they're clear. Let them decide between us. And so here we see Basel, right, having an attitude. One of the things that I see today a lot uh, in, in a lot of these debates, and even in debates that we have uh, with the encroaching uh, you know, power of, of, of atheism in the world and stuff like that, is this idea of, oh, you know, interpretation. Who gets to interpret the Bible? I interpret it one way, you interpret it the other. It's, you know, it's so unclear. And my question is, well, in the verses that we've seen, does it sound like Jesus thought the scriptures were unclear? Does it sound like Peter thought they were unclear? Does it sound like Christians living hundreds of years after the apostles thought they were unclear? They're arguing with heretical groups, and it'd be a lot easier for Basel to just be, like he said, he has tradition too. He probably knows guys that knew guys that knew the apostles. And yet Basel is saying, but you know what? If my tradition disagrees and your tradition disagrees, let's turn to the scriptures. Could he say that if he thought that they were this unclear mess that everyone just has the right to interpret however they want? He couldn't, because the scriptures are also not that. They're not a book that we get to interpret poetically to, to fit our lifestyle. They're the words of the living God. And so we could sit here and ask ourselves, okay, well, you know, you could be thinking, well, Javier, that's cool and all, but what do these, you know, ancient heretical groups of names I can't pronounce, <laughs> right, who claim to be Christian, have to do with us today? To which I would respond, the church is dealing with these exact same threats today. Jehovah's Witnesses deny that Christ is God. They deny that the Holy Spirit's a person. It's almost like they're rolling these two groups together, right? They, 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 said that, they say that he's an, un, an, an impersonal force of some kind. And so my question to you is, do you know how to refute those beliefs from the scriptures? Mormons deny the Trinity. They say that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three separate gods who all became gods, who used to not be gods. And Mormonism claims that you too can be a god one day. Do you know how to refute that from the scriptures? Would you know where to go? Muslims, as well as many atheists today, they say that Jesus never even claimed to be God in the Gospels. Would you know where to turn in the Gospels to disprove them? What about other traditions of men from today, right, that we hear? And, and we may not think of them as traditions of men because we see them in, in social media. We see them uh, sometimes even propounded by, by the people that are at the top of these different, like, authority hierarchies. But they're traditions of men nonetheless. Right? What about the idea of transgenderism, right, that claims that gender is malleable, that men can become women, women can become men? Do you know where to turn to in the scriptures to deal with that? And you may say, well, you know, people might not care about the scriptures. And it's like, okay, well, you know, that's why we learn to argue for why the scripture is the word of God as well, uh, which is outside of the, the scope of the sermon. I don't want to keep us here for forever. But 
when fellow Christians approach you with that, people who, you know, in good faith, hold to the same authority as you, and maybe they're confused, would you know where to turn to talk to them? What about the idea that pre-born human life is not equally precious and valuable as post-birth human life? Right? With this tradition of man that we have, that is that it's okay to kill an infant in the womb, right? Abortion. If you're talking to a fellow Christian that maybe has been taken in by these ideas and by these arguments, by, you know, this, this ingenuity of man and coming up with these, would you know where to go to defend human life in the womb? Would you know where to, where would you go in the scriptures? What we don't want to be is we don't want to be like the Sadducees. We don't want to be the kind of people that Jesus could come to and say, you do not know these things because you do not know the scriptures. Right? I mean, that's what happened to the Pharisees and the Sadducees of Jesus' day. The scriptures testified of the coming Messiah and they killed him because they did not know the scriptures. Right? And they thought that their traditions were worth more than the actual speech of God. And so we need to, just like Jesus, just like several individuals in the early church, and there were mistakes there too, right? But uh, several individuals in the early church, as people throughout all of history, as the Reformers and the Protestant Reformation, as, as the people that came before us that have passed on the baton of Christianity to us in history, we need to stand on the Scriptures. And so our, our final truth that I want to hit today, which we've, I've been hinting at this whole time, is we should treasure the Scriptures and strive to know them well. 2 Timothy uh, tells us this, or the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Timothy, but evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, right? This translation says inspiration of God. What the text really says is, is God breathed. The scriptures are special. It's the only thing in the whole Bible that's described that way. They're the very breath of God. They're breathed out by God. And they are profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And the thing is, I have to ask us, and it's a question that I ask myself is, man, I love these verses, but I have to ask myself on the daily and remind myself, do I really believe this? Because if I believe this, then my actions should reflect it. Do I really believe that the scripture is unique, that it's, it's breathed out by God? Do I think that it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and righteousness? Not just to make me a little bit wise, not just to get you know, my foot in the door a little bit in, in, in Christian knowledge. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I have to ask myself, do I believe that? And I, and I would ask you, do you believe that? And the reason I ask that is because, you know, in the bustle and hustle of today's life, I feel like we don't really value the scriptures like we should. And I'm the first one to admit it in my own life, right? Even as a pastor, right? I, there are times where I may fail to value the scriptures as much as I should. I may go through days where I neglect to read the scriptures for the same reasons that I'm sure a lot of you do. Right? Maybe you were too busy with work that day. Maybe you got caught up with other hobbies that you enjoy, and man, time slipped you by. If you're like me, maybe you got caught up learning about other topics, even topics that are related to the scriptures and are about the scriptures, but are not themselves the scriptures. And here's the thing, right? At the end of the day, and we can, we can sell ourselves on the fact that, no, man, but like, this excuse is just really good. But that's all it is, it's an, it's an excuse. And in and of itself, this idea that we have sometimes, even things that we hear like, like oh, you know, I'm a Christian, and, and I can be a Christian, but like, I, I don't need to read the Bible. I don't need to be at church. I don't need to hear the word of God preached. That, too, is a tradition of man. And it's one that needs to be cut through with the scriptures, with the sharp, double-edged sword that are the scriptures. Because I want you to think about something, right? If you are a Christian, if you believe in the Christian God, Right, the way that I like to think of it, like you guys have heard me say several times, if you believe in the God who designed and spoke the cosmos into existence, notice he's speaking things into existence, and here we have the breath of God right in Scripture. The God who keeps the earth rotating on its axis, the God who knows the whereabouts and purpose of every single creature, down to the tiniest bug on planet earth. The God, as the Scriptures say, 
who, without his approval, a single sparrow cannot fall out of the sky. If we really believe that that God exists, and we really believe that he inspired these books in Scripture, then we have the words of the living God available to us to read on a daily basis. Do you have any idea how awesome that is? It's the words of the living God. And I think if we actually like focused on that, if we thought about it, maybe we wouldn't make excuses to not read the word of God. Or maybe we'd say, man, I want to know what the Lord would have for me. There's, there's a quote that I really like, uh, speaking of the Reformation and all this, as I'm getting ready to close up, uh, from uh, the, the original Protestant reformer, Martin Luther, who said, These are the scriptures which make fools of all the wise and understanding and are open only to the small and simple, as Christ says in Matthew 11, 25. Therefore, dismiss your own opinions and feelings and think of the scriptures as the loftiest and noblest of holy things, as the richest of minds which can never be sufficiently explored in order that you may find divine wisdom which God here lays before you in such simple guise as to quench all pride. Here you will find the, swall- the swaddling clothes and the manger in which Christ lies. Because the final thing that, that I want to leave us with here, right? At the end of the day, as much as I, I love Martin Luther and I love this thought, right? It, the way that he encapsulates it, here you will find the swaddling clothes and the manger in which Christ lies. In the scriptures, right, we have the words of the living God, and not just for any purpose, it's not just, you know, uh, as people say, oh, the Bible, the, the basic instructions before leaving earth. And that's, that's <laughs> we'll talk about next week why that may not be the best uh, uh, acronym and, and stuff. But sometimes we just think about it as this instruction manual and that's it, right? It's just, and how, how, many, how often do you find yourself at home saying, man, I cannot wait to go open the drawer in my kitchen that I like only open once a year and grab one of those manuals for like a dishwasher I've never read and like go read that. Right? We, we don't do that, <laughs> right? And so if we just think about the, the Bible as, oh, it's just this manual, basic instructions before leaving earth, well, we're never going to open it. But the Bible is not just some manual. It's the words of the living God. And not only that, as Luther points out here, the words of the living God in which when we approach them with humility, we will find the swaddling clothes and the manger in which Christ lies. Because in those words of the living God is found the gospel. Right? In the words of the living God is found the fact that we're sinners, that we're sinners that have no hope to ever be reconciled to a holy God, the God that breathed out these very scriptures that we're reading. And yet that God became man, lived the perfect life that we couldn't, died the death that we deserve to pay for our sin, and rose again on the third day to victory evermore. And if we believe that, and we believe that these are the words of the living God that can speak to us, we need to go to them in humility every day to have the gospel told to us time and time again. And I think it would be uh, just to, to, I guess, uh, close, finally, finally, I promise this time, close us out here. I want to leave us with uh, some scripture because I didn't think that a, a sermon about the importance of scripture would be, uh, uh, <laughs> it wouldn't be fitting to finish that with words even from someone as cool as Martin Luther. I think we need to finish it with scriptures. And this is what the Apostle Paul says I'm going to try not to get choked up because normally it chokes up a little bit. But uh, in his final letter that he wrote on the way to be martyred for the faith, the Apostle Paul, on the way to be martyred for standing up for the truths of the gospel found in those words of the living God, and talking to Timothy, a young pastor, says this, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. 
And this may have been ran to a young pastor, but that goes beyond pastoral ministry. My question for you then is, are you ready in season and out of season? Do you know the scriptures? If someone brings a tradition of man that everyone is falling for, is your first thought, how does this comport with the word of the living God? Are you ready, as Paul says, to fight the good fight? That one day, like Paul, you can say, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. And that's the faith that is contained in the words of the living God. And so while I am still your pastor, I want to encourage you to do what the Apostle Paul is saying here. Like I said, be ready in season and out of season. Even if you're not a pastor yourself, right? It's your job to preach the word of God and the good news of the gospel of forgiveness of sins and the eternal life in Jesus Christ found in the pages of scripture everywhere that you go. It's your job to preach that. It's your job to tell it to yourself, like we said earlier. It's your job to tell it to your friends. It's your job to tell it to the random person that you ran into when you were out shopping or hanging out for the day. And one of my final pleas to you here will be, build your life on the foundation that is the living God and his word. Because at the end of the day, knowing the scriptures, as awesome as that is, means nothing if we miss the foundation, the cornerstone of the faith revealed in the scriptures, that is Jesus Christ.